All right, if everyone wants to take their seats, I think we're probably about ready to get started. Um, all right, just while everybody's sitting down, uh, just a big thank you to everyone who helped with the interview process last week. Uh, we had a lot of great applicants and was exciting to meet them, showcase our program, and uh, a lot of effort from the faculty and residents involved with interviews, breakout rooms, other sessions. Uh, and then also a very special thank you to Johnson and Dan. Uh, they really kept things moving well and um, I think uh, put a good impression out there for all the applicants. Um, so for today, um, we have a very special visiting professor. Um, and for an introduction, I'll turn it over to Dr. Swarup. All right, so thanks again, everyone, for a great discussion this morning. I know the topic can sometimes get into the weeds, but it, the concepts are really important. So thank you, Dr. Spiegel. Thank you to the residents who presented. So um, I have the honor this morning of, producing, of presenting our grand, uh, grand round speaker. Uh, Dr. David Spiegel is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, specializing in neuromuscular conditions, spine deformity, and trauma. Uh, he is a professor of orthopedic surgery at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's also holds the Dennis S. Drummond Endowed Chair in Orthopedics at CHOP. Uh, Dr. Spiegel completed undergrad medical school and orthopedic residency at Duke, and then went up to Philadelphia for a research and clinical fellowship in pediatric orthopedics at CHOP. Uh, Dr. Spiegel also holds um, honorary appointments in hospitals in Nepal and Iraq, and he has been invited to deliver over 450 invited lectures throughout the world. Most impressively, Dr. Spiegel has been awarded not one, not two, but three humanitarian awards from POSNA, SRS, and AOS for all of his outstanding work that he's done abroad. On a personal level, I've known Dr. Spiegel since my fellowship in 2018-2019 at CHOP, and I know he has many friends in the audience here as well. Um, I consider him to be one of my closest mentors, and I've always found him to be um, thoughtful, genuine, kind, and brutally honest. Um, so with that, I would like to welcome my mentor and dear friend, Dr. David Spiegel. All right, thanks so much. It's an enormous honor to be here. And um, this is something new, kind of an experimental talk. It's kind of all over the place, but I guess the idea would be hopefully the residents in particular, that there'll be food for thought, things for you to think about as you approach a complex subject. So, and this is complex too, I guess. Maybe if I click this thing, it'll go. All right. Um, I have one disclosure, uh, some royalties for editing a book for Springer years ago, and this is what it amounted to. So I guess you'd say I'm killing it, huh? I don't know what to say, but there have been two guys, Rick and Richard, you know them. They've been an inspiration to me and friends for 25 years. And yesterday coming in for the airport, I was with Rich and we were uh, with Rick and we were on the phone with Rich in Canada. So they've meant a lot to me, their friendship. And it goes on and on. Dr. Vale was my chief resident when I was a junior resident. I'll never forget what a great guy he was and a pleasure to work with. I can't say enough about Colleen Sanjeev. Uh, you know, the work that they're doing in the global space, just as humans and as friends. And the same I can say for Ishan and Nirav, just amazing people. So I feel like I'm home, and now for the first time after knowing him indirectly for 20 years, I met Dr. Diab two days ago. So, all right, I'll go on or else I'll be here too late. So there are a bunch of themes. One, understanding that we're really dealing with a spectrum of diseases and it's heterogeneous. Two, natural history is critical. If we don't understand natural history, then I'm not really sure what we're treating. But it varies between and within the conditions. As time has moved forward, the rest of the world is becoming so genotypic. Every kid is getting an MRI of their brain, all sorts of findings, their genetic testing. Suddenly, what, what used to be in one silo is 20 different uh, aspects of that silo, so much so that you can get lost in it. But for orthopedics, we're still phenotypic. Care needs to be individualized. We need to reach out to colleagues in different disciplines of medicine and we need to think about what happens from a baby to an adult. These are the challenges. And then we recognize that we all work in different contexts and the importance of systems. So I'm going to try to blow through a lot of these topics. So to frame 
the argument, whether or not it works. In my mind, I'm really thinking about those patients who have upper motor neuron problems versus those patients that have lower motor neuron and muscle. I mean, I don't know, I just made this up the other day. But the, I think the main important thing for me is those with upper motor neuron problems have issues with tone, with motor control, with other things that like I can't impact by turning a bone. So there's less reproducibility to certain extent in patients for me with upper motor neuron problems. Oh my God, we have a leukodystrophy, I don't staff it, but we have a leukodystrophy clinic. There are more than 100 diagnoses. And the issue is that, look at all those MRIs, all the unique findings. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I could tell you it's a brain, but not much more than that. But the issue is that these vary. Some patients have a relentless negative trajectory, and they don't survive a long period of time, relentless progression. Other patients can stay static in their neurologic picture for years. So there has to be some nuance, and we have to interact with with the neurologists and others to get a better understanding of the disease in that individual that informs our orthopedic decision making. Because we're not just technicians, we have to be within the context of the overall patient care. So Kerr Graham is a genius in cerebral palsy, and for many years he's written one after another interesting paper. But I found this one which just came out, and the reason why I bring it out is for, for decades, People have tried to classify, let's just say, ambulatory ambulation in patients with cerebral palsy. Can't come quite come to a consensus. And I think this paper says, well, another variable that's really important is how things evolve over time. So this is a patient with, let's just say, a group of patients with diplegia early on. It's mainly tone-related problems as they get older. Then you can develop musculoskeletal issues, which can be addressed. And then, you know, maybe when they get into teenage or adult years, there are a whole other set of problems that occur either as a result of or the result of no treatment or treatment or whatever. And so, you know, how do you conceptualize this? One line, this too is a simplification of multiple complex and nuanced clinical phenotypes. Patients are individuals, very difficult in the neuromuscular. And then take it a step further. For years, I mean, I've, for, for, I've spent about four years of my life at one hospital in a different place. And I can always remember saying, well, I think they, this, these patients would fall into the category of cerebral palsy, but it's not the kind I see in Philadelphia. So why is that so? Why does it look so different? And so we looked at it a little bit, and of course, there are no neonatal ICUs. There are no... Um, you know, in, in settings with limited health care, um, you know, it's a different type of neurologic injury that occurs. So most of the cases occurred from events at the time of birth. Of course, 80 to 90% are home births. And then ironically, a lot of cases were postnatal cases. So you'll find some kids who have a phenotypic cerebral palsy picture who in fact had Japanese encephalitis and had some degree of a motor program developed by the time they had their insult and they behave completely different than some of the patients that you'll see in San Francisco. The other study, I apologize, it didn't come up because of uh, the, the way this uh, screen is going. But anyway, we looked at something simple, and it has to do with access, right? So we would anticipate 100% of hemiplegic patients would walk in the United States with, because we're used to service delivery. But in fact, in Nepal, we found that only about 80% were walking. And, and so the element of lack of service availability and how that compounds it. So I'll go on quickly, but even within the context of the muscular dystrophies, more than 40 genes identified. And if you're familiar, for example, with congenital muscular dystrophies, which are quite uncommon, the phenotype of Ulrich is very different than the phenotype of Bethlehem. So anyway, I think, I think the point is for the residents that there's a lot to, a lot of nuance to understanding these different processes and we require the input from our colleagues. So clinical evaluation, I know this sounds kind of funny, but I don't allow myself to read a chart before I go into the room. I like to go into the room and look around and see what's happening. Is the patient in a wheelchair? Are they sitting? If they're sitting, are they on a device? Uh, can they hold themselves up? 
Are they interacting with their family? Do they notice I'm there? Are they making eye contact with me? All these different issues give you a feel for the type of issues you're going to deal with. And then you talk to the parents, how can I help you? Open-ended question. It's amazing what you'll hear. And then you're getting more and more information. Then you do your physical assessment. And the point is to identify impairments, abnormalities of structure that are, uh, that add up to your, you know, assessment of the patient. So you define the impairments. And for me, that is, what are the neurologic impairments? What are the orthopedic impairments? You can write a list and try to, to frame it for each individual patient. And then, then I try to get the big picture. So then I might look in the chart or if it's, you know, we see so many different diagnoses, you have to read about it. But the bottom line for me is that I often, if I'm planning some type of surgical intervention, particularly if it's something more complex, I'm on the email or the phone with the different caregivers because I need to understand more about this. You know, I don't have that level of nuance to be able to differentiate between many of the diagnoses, especially in the genotypic world. So for the residents, I don't know, I just look at things very simply. Let's just say this patient has cerebral palsy. First thing I want to figure out is what are the upper motor neuron problems? What are the neurologic issues? Well, it's either too much or too little, right? Too much tone. So you do your assessment. Spasticity is a velocity-dependent increase in muscle tone. More dystonia could be fluctuating muscle tone, but it's too much tone. And you can observe too much motion. Is it slow writhing movements of the fingers? Is it entire limb moving? Do the patients moving more when they see you come in to examine them? So too much and too little. Weakness is probably the most underappreciated element of cerebral palsy because it's often masked by the tone. Selective motor control is often impaired. Please dorsiflex your toe. The entire limb moves in a mass limb pattern and issues with balance. If you fix the legs and the patient needs a, an assistive device for issues with balance, they'll still need an assistive device, communication with families. So it seems very simplistic, but I don't know. That's the only way I can frame it in my own mind. And then, of course, we're familiar with the orthopedic assessment. And then having some understanding because we do see metabolic diseases, mitochondrial diseases, so on and so forth, that may potentially, leukodystrophies that may be progressive from the neurologic perspective. So if you're, let's say you're taking care of ambulatory patients with upper motor neuron problems, this is the way I would like to explain it to the family. Please do understand that there are neurologic components to your child's issue that you're witnessing, and there are orthopedic components. This is what I can address and, and, you know, here would be, you know, what I can offer. However, please understand that there are elements that I can't fix that are going on, setting the right expectations in advance of, especially when you're considering, you know, a seminal surgery that might have 14 different procedures. And then, of course, for the lower motor neuron muscle diseases, mainly weakness in addition to the muscular impairments. So, I don't know, I coined this the other night, type in the slide, the neuro-ortho impairment ratio. It's really helpful for me to be able to articulate to the families how much of the problem I think is due to abnormalities of the neurologic system and how much is due to the musculoskeletal problems as I try to build an argument for what can be achieved with what I have to offer. So let's go to the WHO, ICF classification, right? Abnormalities of body function and structure, those are impairments, right? We make a list of impairments, but we don't just fix impairments. We don't just examine patients and find that something's tight and so therefore we restore motion. There has to be some unifying theme, which is typically to enhance participation in activities of daily living or, or whatever have you, or to treat pain or whatnot. So here's a great actually like, oh my God, what happened there? Um, all right, so somebody had some surgery, probably a fracture, then it probably got infected and now there's no elbow. So now you guys are already thinking, geez, what am I going to do about that? But in fact, it wasn't the patient. It was the patient's father. He just wanted to show us his range of motion, and he was a worker. He didn't have any pain. So he had an impairment, but he wasn't disabled. So how are you going to fix that? How about these fellows? They have impairments, but they actually earn a living off those impairments. So they don't want you to fix their whatever it is. Um, because that's how they earn a living. 
listen to people and they'll tell you what you need to know. These fellows on the left side, they weren't patients, but, um, you know, um, if you gave them a set of forearm crutches that were very expensive, they might potentially sell it in the market. Why? Because they'll tell you the stick, what's the material of the stick, how long the stick has to be. And then if you ask them, they'll show you exactly how they use the stick to stand, navigate, and in their activities of daily living. People, especially in environments with limited resources, can be quite resourceful, and they figure it out. All right, so once we get through that, then of course, I mean, I know this is very simplistic, but you have to go back to the basics. What exactly am I trying to accomplish here? I mean, you can watch the patient walk, you can get your gait lab, you can learn from the most brilliant minds in orthopedics like John David's of how to go through that whole process, and then you can come up with a plan. But what's your goal? Are you trying to make the patient look better when they walk? Are you trying to uh, address pain? For example, anterior knee pain with a fixed knee flexion contracture and a flexed knee gait. Uh, do you want to get rid of a brace if possible? What exactly are you after? And if they're a non-ambulator, well, geez, can we achieve standing transfers or can we enhance ambulation? And if not, what other things do we have to offer? Can we improve sitting, positioning, and so on. And, you know, they're certainly built into this whole framework, depending on the disease process and the magnitude of what you might be entertaining, and I'll discuss later spinal issues. You know, there are ethical dilemmas, and you have to work through these with colleagues, with families, in a shared decision-making type of model. You could give a whole talk on outcomes, and I know, I realize I'm sort of flapping my gums here at one of the high-level scientific institutions, and most of the talks you get are probably very meticulous and detailed and basic science and literature-based, and here I am like in the middle of some field somewhere else. But, you know, outcomes according to whom and what you, in a moving target that evolves, like how do you take a continuous variable and, you know, so anyway, I'll go on. So, so for the ambulators, let's just go back to, say, the context of CP or leukodystrophies or whatever you want to say, and ambulatory patients. Well, of course, we need to understand that it's multi-level pathology. We need to be using every resource available to us to identify the impairments and come up with a treatment strategy. Typically, that involves multiple procedures, SEMLs. I'm sure you get plenty of lectures about that and the dose of those procedures. That's not what we're going to go into a lot of detail today. But the cr critical element is, is rehabilitation and the orthotic support. The surgery is the easy part. So, of course, we have to be meticulous, detailed. We have to be, you know, good communicators with the family as to what can be achieved. But we also have to have them understand that this is a lifelong pursuit. And this is one intervention within the context of a, you know, evolving thing. And then there are a lot of things that... Uh, you know, or beyond our control, for example, the upper motor neuron problems that I discussed, you know, cognition, motivation, you know, too many Philly cheesesteaks, you know. I mean, let's be honest, you know, if you take an adolescent patient who has underlying weakness, who's been compensating for a number of years, they can decompensate pretty quickly if they gain weight, especially in the setting of fixed knee deformities, and then the local resources. So, you know, for the residents, like, let's just say that all four of these guys, they have bad contractures at their hip and knee. Let's say they all have the same physical assessment. And, you know, I realize that we're in, in, a, in a less constrained environment resource-wise, but let's say we're in a resource-constrained environment. Every surgery is a big deal. You can't be wasting your surgical time. So what exactly are you thinking about, what if I told you you can only operate on two of these patients? Well, which two are you going to pick and why? They all have the same deformity. Well, look at these fellows up here, here and here. This one I was part of the surgery on 15, 18 years ago. But notice what they're doing. They're crawling. They have some degree of upright mobility. They have upper extremity strength. The fellow in the lower right-hand corner has severe contractures, upper lower extremity spine, the fellow on the, on the left side is a, is a picture given to me by Hugh Watts many years ago. He can't lift his rear end off the table. He doesn't have adequate triceps function. So the lower right and the left, you can do whatever you want. You can make their legs straight. They're not going to walk. Whereas the fellows in the upside, 
you get those legs straight, they're going to go. So I found this paper, and we're now actually trying to apply this to late presenting kids with CP to see if any of this can hold. But basically, the take-home message is if you see the patient, this is in polio, if you see the patients who crawl like they are in the blue circles or have that degree of mobility, then get on it because they have an adequate trunk and upper extremities to be able to be rehabilitated by lower extremity surgery. If they don't, then you might invest in an activity chair or a wheelchair or something else to help the patient, but don't operate on their legs. All right, technical solutions because it's orthopedic conference, so I have to talk about like some operations, I think, so I'll try to do that. So hips, all right, what are the problems of the hips? There are contractures of the hips, and then there's hip dysplasia. We just spent an hour on hip dysplasia, and I'll put a couple of slides on it. So in the children who have cerebral palsy, quite commonly, they do have a hip flexion contracture, and the, that's the Thomas test there. But the key concept is you don't want to release the psoas off the lesser trochanter, right? That causes considerable weakness. So there are a lot of techniques. The one I'm showing you on the right is for, in other words, what you'd like to do is a recession. You don't want to release the muscle. You want to do an intramuscular recession. Multiple inguinal What we do is above the inguinal ligament, you uh, open the fascia. You can see the femoral nerve right in front of you, so you can control it, protect it. You get it out of the way, and then you can dissect free the tendon from with the substance of the muscle and release it. I have to say we don't do that many of these procedures because a lot of times the contractures are small. And what's more interest is that the, quote, flexion contracture when it's associated with abduction. And it's important because I do this surgery in Philadelphia on patients with congenital muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy, because they get contractures very similar to that in polio. They get flexion abduction contractures. So here's the physical assessment down here. You can see the patients on their side. One, leg, one uh, hip is flexed up, and you internally rotate abduct and extend the affected leg and you see if it will drop down to the table. And that is the physical exam finding for the flexion abduction contracture. So it's a polio patient upper left, SMA patient lower left. So there is a procedure called, the, I believe, oberfasciotomy would be the appropriate term, but it's basically a release of the tensor extending back. Don't go beyond the trochanter because you don't want to get into the hip extensors. And sometimes you have to get the indirect, uh, you have to get the rectus. But I don't think I've ever opened the hip capsule or addressed uh, the psoas. And, you know, you get most of the way there, and then you can complement that with physical therapy, a lot of prone lying. So that's, that's a polio surgery that is very effective and helpful in conditions that we treat today. Now, if they have bad knee flexion contractures, you can extend it to a yount fasciotomy in which you excise the distal iliotibial band, the intermuscular septum, sometimes the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. So that becomes your ober yount procedure. So I'll show you one example of that. Now, so in my practice, I've done a lot of ober fasciotomies. I haven't uh, done the yount component, but this is pretty cool. Well, I'll tell you why, because there's a story with everything. Here's a fellow 17 years old from the Kumbu region of Nepal, never walked. Um, very bright guy, and my friends and colleagues who taught me how to do this did an over yank procedure. And you say, good God, what are they doing there? Yanking on his legs with the traction. Like, what, is this the Spanish Inquisition, or what's happening here? Well, in fact, I mean, you've got severe contractures at the hip and knee. I mean, you're not going to get that by doing surgery. You'll get it 20% of the way there with the soft tissue release. And you don't really want to do anything bony because that would create far too extreme a deformity. So the only solution is the traction. So you're pulling distally, and that's great. But recall that the proximal tibial pin and the, the, the vector going north is to prevent the tibia from becoming dislocated on the femur, right? And so that's an important component. There he is six weeks later. And the reason why I show is the picture on the right side was three weeks ago. So... Uh, it was national. It was a Worldwide Disability Day, and I just happened to be at the hospital in Ka outside Kathmandu, and there he was playing the flute. He works for the hospital, and his wife works for the hospital too. So it was pretty cool. I was telling them, you know, I've been showing your case to our residents for 20 years. You're starting to get some gray hair now, and he had a good laugh over that. So we talked a lot an hour about uh, 
the CP hip and hip dysplasia and CP. And so um, I had a couple of slides that I wonder if I didn't, I don't think I messed anything up here. Try to get this back. So if it doesn't come on, I can. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so we spoke a lot about this, so I'll run through it pretty quickly. But obviously, you can have neuromuscular hip dysplasia in spastic patients, in, in flaccid patients, so on and so forth. And in the cerebral palsy population, as shown here, those that don't walk, GMFCS 4 or 5, 70 to 90 percent hip dysplasia. So we spoke earlier today about the a historic method of trying to prevent the need for big surgery by doing soft tissue releases or doing Botox and splinting, whatever. And those have been found to be ineffective. And so the most recent technique I'll just introduce you to is called guided growth. And, you know, the literature is not, uh, there aren't a lot of papers out there, but the concept is that if you intervene in a high risk patient before the horse is out of the barn, that perhaps you can prevent the need for a big surgery. Or if you have a little bit more advanced situation, perhaps you can buy time for a few years and delay the need for surgery. Um, the technique is typically done with a cannulated screw and you do an orthogram so that you can maximize the length of the screw. But the concept is preventive. You know the natural history is poor. Can you do something relatively simple? And this is outpatient stuff. The problem is standing in front of you, the difficulties that we have is the initial results are encouraging, but the big question is exactly who should get this and exactly when. When is it too far gone? Now, my sense would be that if your migration of the epiphysis beyond the Perkins line is more than 40 to 50 percent and you're seeing a break in Shenton's line, uh, I don't think it's probably going to get the job done in those patients. So anyhow, that's food for thought. And if we're doing, as shown in the last conference, the typical strategy is to address the, ab, the osseous abnormalities of the femur, coxa valga, and antiversion, the acetabular deficiency, which is typically global or posterior. And then, so we do femoral varus osteotomy, pelvic osteotomy. And to use a, a term that I saw in a paper by John Davids, hypercontainment, you'd like the lateral margin of the acetabulum to be beyond the epiphysis. And here's a guy who had a 10-year follow-up of that showing how the acetabulum can remodel. So anyhow, let's move on to the salvage. And there's the trough in the anterolateral femoral head in a patient from the indirect head that we discussed in the last conference. So there are a lot of different options for the chronically symptomatic femoral head or, or hip displacement, be it subluxation or dislocation, that is causing chronic pain and is not felt to be re resect. Um, reconstructable. And as you can tell that when there are that many options, nobody really knows what's the best option. We did a systematic review, but I forgot to quote it. But anyway, we basically found that arthrodesis was not a good choice, but beyond that, most of the other strategies employed in the literature had about equal success rates in achieving pain relief. So the most common things are the head and neck resection in the valgus and the subtrochanteric. So what, what would be my approach? We discussed in the last conference doing a femoral head and neck resection in a valgus osteotomy. Uh, essentially, the technique that I use was taught to me by Norgrove Penny as part of the Ilazar of hip reconstruction. It's just the proximal part and not the distal part. And because a size, you know, a, some of our patients like to be in standards, some take a few steps in a gait trainer, and so this provides some support for that. And then the other issue is that nothing works 100% of the time, and if this is unsuccessful, I can still drop back and, and, and go to a subtrochanteric resection. So, I mean, I don't have any real science, but at least this is the approach that we've come to. So, now this is a cool thing, because what about SMA? And, and that's really, it's, it's unusual in your career that you see game-changing medical developments that ask you to reframe your management of a problem. And I would say the hips in SMA are one of those issues. So you recognize that there are these disease-modifying treatments. They're better, doing better in terms of their effectiveness when they're administered early, ideally shortly after birth. But now there's genetic testing for SMA and, and so on. So treatment has started early, and it's having an impact. It's modifying the disease. Gene therapy... Uh, you're familiar with the Spinraza from intrathecal injections, the oral agent Rizdaplam, and their combinations. But 
the real point is to think about that we're talking about hips now. How are we rethinking how we approach patient care? And so it's we didn't used to routinely get x-rays in the SMA hips because we didn't routinely treat them. But I did have one patient that I fixed their spine a couple of years ago that I, I dug into the record and saw this sequence of events, which essentially shows the natural history. Progressive valgus deformity, subluxation, dislocation. And uh, the child's now 18 years old, clearly deformity of the femoral head and neck. Uh, I fixed the spine and the hips are still asymptomatic, so I'm continuing to monitor that. So the old literature basically uh, was consistent with what one might have concluded from polio in that if there's no muscle forces around the hip, um, flaccid dislocations typically don't hurt. And if you do choose to reconstruct them, you can expect variable outcomes with a lot of failures. So why do anything? And that, I think, was in, in many centers the, the sort of philosophy of involvement. But now we have to rethink that. So here's a recent paper showing that 60% of patients actually had some pain in their hips, and fortunately, it wasn't severe in most. But with these new medical treatments and with muscular, muscular strength improving, does that mean that the hips will become symptomatic? I don't know. So, you know, the next 10 to 20 years are going to be all about, well, number one, is there any role for guided growth or prevention? And I don't know. And number two, when should we pull the trigger on a hip reconstruction in these patients? And in our practice, we're, modif we're monitoring the patient's um, strength. We're monitoring acquisition of uh, you know, skills and so on. We're looking at symptoms, and we're taking it on an individualized basis. How about the knees? Knee contractures are... I apologize. I got to... Okay, so hopefully, hopefully I'm on track here. All right, so biggest problem, of course, is inability to extend the knee. Consequences of walking with a flexed knee position would include quadriceps incompetence, inferior pole stress fractures. In the upper motor neuron population, you're well aware that it can be contracture and spasm of the hamstrings, which contributes to the inability to extend the knee. Uh, however, in the lower left, if you're examining with the hip extended, lack of knee extension represents a fixed knee flexion contracture. In the uh, lower motor neuron patients, I find that typically they don't have, although they can have severe hamstring contractures, it's more often a more pronounced fixed knee flexion, whereas in the cerebral palsy kids, depending on the age and stage of development, it's really a hamstring contracture early on, and then by the time they're teenagers, the fixed knee flexion is the predominant enemy that's interfering with their function. So anyway, there are technical solutions for everything, and I'd like to blow through them, but I would say that we use serial casting a fair amount because we see a lot of patients who, well, I guess I could say they, for whatever reason, they haven't accessed the health system and they come in with pretty severe flexion contractures and they don't have a surgical solution and we have to serially cast them to get to the point where we can offer a surgical solution. Soft tissue lengthening, uh, I think most, unless I'm mistaken, would avoid doing a capsulotomy the literature and, and anecdotal experience has suggested that deformities relapse and that nerve injuries, stretch injuries are more common. So I've never been taught that, nor have I practiced that. And in the Bowen, you're essentially creating a deformity to treat a deformity, and there's a menu for that. So Norgrove Penny, I keep mentioning his name. He's been uh, a, a nice teacher for me. And he uh, has written up this technique for casting in polio. Again, the concept similar to the traction I showed you before, prevent the knee from subluxating, the tibia from subluxating posteriorly at the knee. And so with these specified cuts, uh, that's achieved. So here's a patient that I'm doing. We put the cast on and then we wedge it. And then the second week we take the cast off. Always put your wedge in and find something else to do for 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, I have had patients who, over the course of the first five or 10 minutes, have developed dysesthesias. Put a smaller wedge in there. So don't just quickly wrap it and send them out. Give a little bit of time for them to adjust and make sure everything's okay before they leave. Uh, hamstrings, I'm not going to talk about this much except, again, nuance. That in, for example, the cerebral palsy population, we, re we recognize that hamstrings can be short, um, but that they're also an important hip extensor during stance phase. And so 
uh, unnecessary lengthening of the hamstring can uncover anterior pelvic tilt and require the knees to be flexed to compensate or can cause recurvatum at the knee. So there are consequences to everything. And, uh, but I'll, I'll stop at that point because I know you get lectures on that. Uh, so create a deformity to treat a deformity. That seems to be uh, rational for a fixed knee flexion contracture. And so if the patients have a lot of growth left, you can consider guided growth, about a degree per month you can get. In this case, this is one of my partner's cases, uh, plates were used. Turns out that these are often symptomatic. So the most recent technique that's been advocated involves the placement of cannulated screws in the anterior third uh, past the growth plate. And this, uh, the ones I've done have not been symptomatic. So that's been a positive development. In the older patients, of course, who don't have adequate growth and have severe deformities, I typically cast them down to a deformity of ideally 20 degrees. Tom Novacek uh, taught me that. And then a distal femoral extension osteotomy. And Dr. Gage's data suggested that you should also retention the extensor mechanism. You can advance a bone block, you can advance a tendon, or you can do a plication techniques are available. But the concept is the same trying your best to retension the extensor mechanism to reduce the risk of relapse of the knee flexion contracture. And you can see that with realignment that these patellar stress fractures will reliably heal and the pain will go away. Okay, foot and ankle, 812. So uh, hopefully I'm on time. I don't know, but you'll let me know in about 18 minutes. Um, so the same concept upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron. So weakness is, is a feature of both. Muscle imbalance is a feature of both. And the unique thing about the muscle imbalance, spastic versus flaccid, is transferring an entire muscle versus hedging your bets and doing split transfers, okay? And you couple on top of that abnormalities of tone, motor control, balance, and then you put on top of that the impact of weight bearing within the context of potentially you know, rotational malalignment in the lower extremities. So that's like this uh, pot that's uh, swirling around there of a lot of different things. But I guess, you know, for the residents, the principle is first element is restoring, you know, anatomy. Second element is, is addressing the imbalance between muscles that help to get you to that point. Um, arthrodesis I'll talk a little bit about. It gets a bad reputation, certainly in the adult population, but I would argue it's an essential part of your uh, toolbox when treating the neuromuscular problems. And then recognizing, for example, in diseases like Charcot-Marie-Tooth, that the neurologic condition may progress, and that's important in informing families about what the, the expectations are for the next 20, 30 years. So one of the things that we always try to talk about is, I'm sure you're all familiar with the residents with the silver skull test and the difference between the gastrocnemius being a two-joint muscle, the soleus being an important power generator, anti-gravity muscle, and being a single-joint muscle. So you do your physical exam, the knee is flexed, that's relaxing the gastroc, you're testing the soleus. You extend the knee and you're bringing the gastrocnemius into it. One of the issues that's uh, commonly a big problem would be, or at least historically was, was Z-lengthening the Achilles in patients with spastic diplegia, particularly if you didn't address upstream problems in the same setting. And that's kind of a recipe for disaster. And so the point is there are a lot of different ways you can get a job done. And so you start with a good physical exam and you understand the disease process. Zone 3 lengthenings of the Achilles are non-selective, right? Both components are being lengthened. Biggest amount of lengthening, biggest amount of weakness. In contrast, Zone 1 involves the least amount of correction with the least amount of weakness. But the nuance is, for example, in a patient with spastic diplegia who might have just an isolated contracture of the gastrocnemius component of that muscle tendon unit, that you can do a strayer procedure or an isolated gastrocnemius recession. So based on your physical exam and the underlying disease process, you're adapting a strategy that's least likely to give you a complication down the road. And Dr. Gage taught me the modified strayer, as he called it, that you're for the proximal third of the leg. You can also make a cut in the fascia over the soleus to get you a little bit of correction if the soleus is tight. 
but you're doing differential lengthening of the gastrocnemius and the soleus. So anyway, um, bouncing on again, the concept of um, spastic versus flaccid. In spastic equinovarus, I know your test question for the in-training is probably tibialis anterior, but the literature I'm available, uh, I've availed myself has suggested that perhaps it's tib and a third, tib post a third to both a third, and both uh, abnormalities a, a third of the time. So the concept is that of doing a split transfer, right? So if you had a polio patient and it was flaccid, you would transfer an entire tendon. But you don't want to do that in spastic disease because it might create the opposite deformity. So you hedge your bets. You reduce the deforming force and you try to reorient half of the tendon to augment the weak force and balance things out. Tib post to the perineus brevis or the dorsum. I don't think there's reliable clinical examination or reproducible way to say which of these to do. And in gate lab, unless you can get a fine needle electrode into the tibialis posterior, it's a little bit difficult. So I find most of the time, and, and I don't know, I'll have to ask the team here, most of the time I'm, I'm hedging my bets and doing a lengthening of the tib post with a split tibialis anterior. Traditionally, that's been to the cuboid. In more recent years, literature has surfaced suggesting that you can transfer to the perineus brevis or tertius with an adequate result. Um, I've tried all of them. I don't have the science to tell you anything else. Now, one of the interesting thing is, again, for the residents to try and, this is all, I realize I'm very simplistic in my assessments, but I'm kind of a Cro-Magnon man, and that's the way I have to think about things. But anyway, think about the front and the back. What the front does, the back's going to do the opposite. What the back does, the front's going to do the opposite. So take a cave ovaris foot. Some of them have some aquinas, but let's rule that out for the sake of this argument. All right, it's in a position that's very nice for push-off, pretty crummy for weight acceptance and stance phase, whereas the equinoplano valgus foot is great for weight acceptance and stance phase, but miserable for push-off. Dr. Gage used to say, it's like moving a rock with a rubber crowbar. In his whole lever arm dysfunction thing and reconstructing the skeleton and that whole thing, David, that's what you have to do. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, so anyway, so in the cave ovaris foot, the front is, the mis is misbehaving and the back is compensating. In the equinoplano valgus, the back is the perpetrator and the front is doing the opposite. And the reason why I mention that is, you know, you may orient towards fixing whatever part you're going to fix, but then you have to look at the front or back depending and address that as well. And I'll show you an example. So Let's take the cave of Varus, real quick and simplistic uh, assessment of this. So your tib ant's weak, your perineus longus is cranking it out. The first ray goes down. The foot's a tripod, first, fifth, and heel. So if you've got plantar flexion of the medial column in the first ray, <clears throat> excuse me, then for you to walk flat, then the, the foot's going to roll down and the heel's going to go into Varus. Perineus brevis is weak. When the, he, when the foot is in that position as shown in your lower right, suddenly your tibialis posterior is a strong deforming force, and actually your Achilles is also becomes a deforming force. So this isn't a lecture on the cave of Mara's foot, but the concept would be that the problem starts in the front of the foot. And if you get it early, you can fix the front of the foot by restoring the medial column anatomy with an osteotomy and balancing your forces. Perineus longus is, is a villain, so get rid of it and stick it to the perineus brevis. Uh, tibialis posterior is misbehaving. Take it and put it on the dorsum of the foot. And then assess the hind foot. If you got to it late and the calcaneus is fixed in varus, don't forget to fix that. If the, if the hind foot is flexible, leave it alone. That's the concept with that. And I know you could have a whole lecture on that, but anyway. So let's move to the opposite. So here's the situation. The patient's walking flat foot. I'm sure you're very familiar with this, but anyhow, you're going to do a reconstruction to, to fix the hind foot, and then you have to be aware of the forefoot. So the most common intervention is that of the lateral column lengthening, a calcaneal osteotomy, the salter osteotomy of the foot. You can do a calcaneal cuboid distraction arthrodesis. But recall that when you do correct the back, look for the forefoot varus, and if it's not flexible, address that with a medial column osteotomy and also consider placation of the capsule on the tip post. 
And for the sake of completeness, I would say that that's not the only option that's available to you, although I have no experience with this technique. The triple C osteotomy has been reported to have adequate results. So how about fusion? I realize I have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to try to roll. Okay, rigid, severe, sensate, low demand. In GMFCS3 patients, they take about a third of the steps as age match controls. So the wear and tear argument is not working for me. Um, they don't have good motor control. Um, so I've come to the conclusion that I'd prefer to have a, a, a rock solid, stable hind foot in GMFCS3 patients. Whereas the GMFCS1s and 2s, I tend to approach more like you would approach as an age match control. And then from the polio literature, never forget that you also have to balance muscles. So even if you do a fusion of the hind foot, recall that tib and other muscles will go beyond the hind foot, and they can cause a deformity of the fore part of the foot. So um, this was a patient with severe Charcot-Marie tooth and ended up doing a triple in addition to tendon transfers to try and balance things out. So how about the spine? I'm not going to spend much time on this with eight minutes left, but you guys all know what the, the common consequences are. And I think in more recent years, we're getting a lot more referrals from the pulmonologist recognizing the impact of spinal deformity on pulmonary function. So we spoke before a lot about the ethical issues, and I agree with you. This is a complex shared decision-making model, multiple disciplines. So Positional curve control, I think, is a great idea. We tend to use a soft spinal orthosis. I'm not sure that wheelchair modifications are so successful. Early on, they may be. That orthosis can improve positioning and ease of care. I would think it possibly could slow the progression of a spinal deformity. I don't think there's literature to support that or, or refute that. And then when you get into the operative realm, the choices are growth sparing or arthrodesis. So as I mentioned, the ethical issues, this is a patient whose family elected not to consider surgical management, and uh, this custom seating system was developed to accommodate the patient's deformity, and that's a very appropriate solution for a subset of our patients. Growth-sparing technologies, I know you're seeing all of these here, so I won't belabor it except to say that in particular for diagnoses such as spinal muscular atrophy with the new disease-modifying treatments, that it's very important to develop the, the capacity to do early onset treatment, whether you be a fan of the non-spine-based, the vector-type-based growth-sparing strategy or a spine-based strategy such as growing rods, be they magnetic. The concept is still the same, and it's a very important one in the neuromuscular diseases as you're seeing a lot of early onset scoliosis. And uh, thanks, Jason and Ari, but you know, in a lot of, like, for example, in SMA, in, in addition to the intrinsic lung pathology, you have a lot of chest wall weakness, and you can develop this chest wall deformity called the parasol, which on top of all that, the spinal deformity would add more impairment. So this growth sparing strategy with the vector can be modified to address the spine and the chest wall at the same time. Okay, one quick note, um, and I just this is for the sake of completeness because I don't think anything's been written about it, but I wanted to remember a close friend, Bob Campbell, who, as many of you know, passed about six years ago, but he was, uh, uh, this was a patient in the upper right with Edwards syndrome that wasn't expected to survive, who uh, has bilateral congenital diaphragmatic hernias and was not felt to be a candidate for surgery, definitive spine fusion. She's interactive. She's been my patient since two years old. So I asked Bob, uh, what do you think? Can you help me? And he came up with the concept of a palliative vector. So not to say that this is right or wrong, but he put that device in her. And now we're eight years later. She's 21. I saw her in clinic a few weeks ago, and she's still doing okay. It has had to be revised on one side, but I, I think it's been successful in her case in, in serving as a, a temporizing measure. Um, and I'll go on in the interest of time. The other question I was going to quickly bring up is that of um, we're all taught or our tradition has been to fuse to the pelvis. Are there circumstances where we might consider fusing short of the pelvis? And uh, in a review of all this literature and some personal experience, I would say that both patient and radiographic features are important. And so with regard to the patient variables, I think it's important to look at head and trunk control 
even if non-ambulatory, flaccid more than spastic, radiographic features, uh, certainly looking at the degree of pelvic obliquity. I'm certainly more confident if I can balance the films on a track, uh, balance the curve on a traction film and so on. So this is just food for thought. But with five minutes left, I'd like to, um, and I hope I'm not going over time, I hope my clock is okay. I wanted to talk a little bit, um, I just threw this in there, about context and systems. I think you guys are really at the pinnacle of global. Global meaning a state of mind, not just doing wonderful work globally, but global being a state of mind. And I think, uh, so I wanted to sort of ruminate a little bit on this for a couple of minutes, but nothing is useful in isolation. And so it may be nice to, to be able to identify and do gate lab and do assembles and treat an ambulatory patient and address all of the impairments and do a technically acceptable job. But that has nothing to do with a patient outcome in a child who's going to become an adult right? Where, what's the system in the context? So systems are, I would say, like living, breathing creatures, right? So you're working within, I hope this analogy will work, but you're taking care of patients within a system. Sim in complex systems, behavior is nonlinear. It's not like a fracture, you fix the bone, it's straight, goodbye, right? So if you do a seminal surgery, and you haven't organized an appropriate rehabilitation protocol, the right braces, the right weight, the right healthy lifestyle that will mandate that that child will continue to do the best to exercise, the response of the system might cause your treatment to fail. So you may have done an excellent job technically, but you end up with a failure because the system response led to that failure. So... That's a lot of torture, huh, for orthopedists? But anyway, what I would say is that's something called a causal loop diagram, and I'll only leave it up for about 20 seconds because I see people, you know, have Maalox bottles coming out of the pockets. But if you really analyze the multiple elements of a system, the point to this is that there's multiple interactions between elements within a system. Some have a positive impact on a given thing. Some have a negative and so this is what my brain tells me about caring for kids with neuromuscular problems as they go into adulthood. And now I'll take it away because that's it for that. But anyway, you start thinking about a patient and a family and where do they live? What's their community? What's the society? Again, I'm thinking global. You have to think about it. You guys are doing lots of international work. You're doing beautiful work. People are looking for advice and it can't just be technical. You can't offer technical advice until you've been to someone's home and you understand the environment, be it in Uganda, Nepal, Philadelphia, San Francisco. So each of these patients is interacting with so many different people. And I find that often no one's communicating and they're not receiving the same message. And they often have a very poor concept of their underlying disease process, the trajectory, the natural history, and what we're trying to accomplish. And I don't have a solution to this problem, but the first thing is recognizing the problem. So getting back, if I have an, a, a big surgery to do, I'm always worried. What's the landmine that I'm going to step on? You know, um, this patient has X process and it's an upper motor neuron process or it's a metabolic myopathy or God knows what it is. First thing I do is I send emails out to the important providers and I ask, please help me with some nuance here. What do you think about this? Is this patient fit for that? What do we anticipate is going to happen as this patient goes? And sometimes on a few occasions, we've even had a family meeting when there was very high risk involved. And uh, it's tough. And, you know, everyone's busy. And it takes a lot of time to sort these issues out, but they're critical. Settings with limited resources, all right, just at the last minute, which I almost, I almost did it on time, a minute or two. They're survivors, the kids, right? They haven't had an ICUs. They haven't had great medical care. So by definition, they're phenotypically less involved. So I've always told friends, I think I can do a lot more with such conditions in Nepal than I can in Philadelphia. Um, 
diagnosis, most of the time you won't have a diagnosis in that context. You're not going to get MRIs. There's no neurologist. And then they present delayed. So these are the issues. Don't count on the system. Choose interventions wisely and have a, wisely and have a plan. So you want to go to wherever and teach semels? Beware. You can teach impairments and technical solutions, and we can do a good job about that. But until we understand the context and everything, we're not going to succeed. So enabling abilities, like for example in Nepal, where families live under uh, extended uh, families live under one roof, often the parents are out, and the disabled children are with the grandparents. You know, physical therapists. You have to train the grandparents to promote healthy living, to do physical therapy. Um, and, and there's beautiful resources available for that that can give you a lot of insight into simple things that can promote uh, development. The last slide would be that of your community. So, you know, we reviewed one case of a clubfoot thing that we wrote a number of years ago where we found 91% of kids we treated in, in, in uh, walking age at 11 years follow-up in the villages of Nepal. How we do that? This is reverse innovation. This is learning for me, community-based rehabilitation. You take uh, a member from each district around the country, you train them in everything you would like them to know, physiotherapy, orthoses, whatever it is. They live there and they help you to attend to the needs of your patients in that community. And I tell people all the time, there are patients in Philly that live three miles from the hospital who get lost to follow-up. So I would call this a reverse innovation. So anyway, the final comments, two minutes late, and I apologize for that. Or maybe I started two minutes late. I don't know. This is a spectrum of diseases. The number of diagnoses are growing, growing, growing. But in orthopedics, we're phenotypic. So we do a careful assessment. You know, we define impairments. We try to contextualize those. We recognize that we need input from multiple colleagues. <clears throat> Excuse me. We recognize that kids go to be adults. We need to be thinking about the whole timeline and the importance of communication with families and with other caregivers. We have to set some sort of a goal or we're going to react to something. And then we come up with technical solutions to that problem. And then we understand that we work within a certain context and we try our best to understand the system we work in so that we don't get failures because the system isn't designed to maximize the benefits of our surgery. So anyway, quick slide from this jazz place in Philly called South. Life is George Gershwin. Life is a lot like jazz. <clears throat> it's best when you improvise. You got that right. Uh, I thank Ashok Ben Skoda, a friend for 27 years, a friend, a mentor, a colleague, a collaborator, a teacher. He's everything. That's his place, and I've learned more there than anywhere. Um, also, thank Jim Gage, who took a lot of time with me to teach me. And then John Davids, who ironically was one of my attendings when I was a resident. And uh, he's a phenomenal mind in pediatric orthopedics, and he's a voice of reason and, and a technical giant as well. So all of these people and many more have, like, informed this talk. So thanks for listening to me. I very much appreciate it. It's a great honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Spiegel. That was fantastic. And uh, thank you especially also for Journal Club last night, case conference this morning. Um, I think a lot of great interaction and um, a lot of great information. And just as a, an additional thank you, we have a little plaque to present to you. And uh, I think in the interest of time, we'll probably wrap up here, but you will have another session with the residents. So a lot more discussion and uh, I think more time with the PEDS group as well. So ongoing discussion, but thank you so much for visiting and speaking to us today. Pleasure.